Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke chapter 14, verses 12 to 24. Verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who are invited shall taste my banquet. This is the word of the Lord. Now I invite Pastor Robert Kaw for today's sermon. Blessed morning to all of you out there. The peace of the Lord be with you. I want you to know uh, that uh, our intercessors, yeah, uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, and uh, even Sunday morning, they are also intercessors. Yeah? They are praying for your spiritual and uh, physical and emotional well-being. Yeah? And so we really appreciate yeah, those who are behind the scene and uh, or those who are coming together uh, for the prayer meetings to pray yeah, uh, for the church. And you are also being prayed for. <clears throat> now, if anyone has a prayer need, uh, please do not hesitate to contact me or any of our leaders. Yeah? We would uh, pray for you. You just have to uh, text us or call us. Yeah? Uh, before we hear, go on to hear God's word, uh, let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we uh, can come together, Lord, even as we uh, worship you, Lord, even as we recall the reading of the Psalms in the openings, uh, worship, Lord, Psalm 84, 4, and, uh, and uh, you, know, you have put the, stood up, Lord, our hearts uh, to pray, to worship you, and to pray the prayers, Lord, that we utter to you, Lord, in, from our hearts for the seniors and uh, we thank you lord for even lord reminding us of you are a good god who's a giver in so many ways lord you have shown yourself to us lord the reality lord of you uh, in our church in our personal lives and even for your protection we do not take for granted lord uh, uh, all that we have come to know you as you reveal to us in your word and also lord through our experience of you and we give you thanks we thank you, Lord, for the one, two, Lord, who uh, provide us with your word each 
uh, to guide us, Lord, each day, not just on the Lord's day, to hear your word together as a family of God, but also, Lord, uh, day by day, Lord, that you nourish us uh, spiritually, for which we give you thanks, and that we may all grow, Lord, uh, in grace and in the knowledge of uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father in heaven, we commit and surrender this time to you, Lord, and that may your spirit continue, Lord, to minister to us, uh, to put into our hearts, Lord, something you want us to hear, pay attention, understand, and do. This we ask in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Today we are going to look into uh, the passage, uh, Luke uh, 14. Uh, the scriptures uh, that were read to us was from uh, uh, verses uh, 14 onwards to 24. But actually I want to also cover from verse 1. It's quite a long passage. That's why I just uh, text to you all the passage beforehand through your cell group leaders. Uh, from verse 1 to verse 24, and that sets the context for it. Yeah? <clears throat> and so we, uh, we, we will be looking at the uh, parables of Jesus. Yeah? <clears throat> now, a parable is a story, is an earthly story yeah, uh, of everyday situation uh, that is familiar to the audience. So if you are in uh, the days of Jesus and you hear a parable from him, uh, you will easily identify, you know, uh, whether it is a person, or whether it is a, a situation, yeah, or whether it's an object, and that will be familiar with you. A parable contains a concealed truth, a hidden truth, seen from the divine perspective. And for those who hear, and uh, who pay attention, who perceive, who understand, or even didn't know, but uh, ask Jesus to explain, yeah, they will come to an understanding of what was concealed within the parable, yeah? And then we'll be able to see the things uh, from the perspective uh, from above, yeah? Uh, <clears throat> knowing the uh, audience heart condition, Jesus spoke a few parables fitted for the occasion, not just in this Luke 14 passage, but in other passages as well. What was the precursor the prior or occasion or incident that led uh, to Jesus speaking, the parable of the guests, the parable of the host, and the parable of the bank great banquet in Luke chapter 14. Why did he speak these parables? What were these parables about? What did they mean? And how are they relevant to us today? So let us, church, begin to explore uh, them together and look first at the occasion for the parables. Jesus was invited to dine at the house of a Pharisee leader or ruler on Sabbath day. The Pharisees and uh, experts in religious law uh, the, those who were present uh, uh, during the time of the feast, they were watching Jesus closely and carefully, prob probably hoping to entrap him. Yeah, because previously Jesus had denounced them, pronounced the woes upon them in Luke 11, verses 39 to 52. Now, at that place, <clears throat> Jesus then saw a man whose body was swollen with fluid. It's like I got water retention in the body, in the tissues of the body. And Jesus healed the man. And then Jesus questioned the religious leaders. In the past, the religious leaders questioned Jesus. And it's the same question, actually. And now Jesus turned the table around and ask them this question that they had asked in the past. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? When they refused to answer, they were silent. Jesus touched the sick man and healed him. And then Jesus sent him away. Now, it would seem that the man might might not have been an invited guest, but a planted man to test him. 
that's my reading of the passage. And also some commentators also uh, uh, attested to that. And, and I was looking at the circumstantial evidence. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, the, the man, I think, was not an invited guest, but planted there. Otherwise, the Pharisees might have persuaded him to stay on to dine. If he had been the invited guest, why let him go? Yeah, uh, If you invited someone to your house to eat, and then something good happened to him, and then you, are, you allow him to go off. I don't think it's like that. Yeah, So it, it is... Probable, yeah. While the text did not mention, it is probable that the man was planted there for their not good reasons, for the Pharisees' uh, reason to, to trap Jesus or to test him. There is one key point here concerning Jesus' healing of the man not to be missed. Not only Jesus reversed his sickness, Jesus also demonstrated his divine power over sickness. And that word healing there in that passage, yeah, the Greek word uh, uh, gave this meaning yeah, that Jesus reversed the sickness and also demonstrated his divine power. And this ought to have prompted those who witnessed the miraculous healing event to glorify God. But they did not. Glorify God. As Proverbs 25 verse 27 would put it, instead, they searched their own glory. And so we're going to look into the parable of the guest and see something of this that I've mentioned. <clears throat> the parable of the guest. They were more concerned to exalt or honor themselves over others even over Jesus, because they did not give glory to Jesus when Jesus healed the man. And they were more concerned about their own honor yeah, in the things that happened uh, at the feast. This attitude of theirs becomes clear as the parable of the guests unfolds. And their attitude was reflected in their action. And so what happened? They maneuvered to get the best seats for themselves, not considering the interests of others. They felt like they were self-entitled to sit where they chose, at the place of honor, nearest those who were noteworthy, famous, or important. In the parable of the guests, Jesus warned against being presumptuous. Not just, to pre, not just presume, but also not to be overconfident or self-confident, even not to act arrogantly. Oh, that's my place, you know. Okay, don't take it from me. I came here first, I saw it first, and then <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just imagining uh, what they were doing there, all clamoring, jostling, uh, what the best place to sit. And this happened without the consideration of others. Why? Because the host could anytime ask them to give up their seats. Not to be presumptuous. Eh? Because the host can come to them at any time and ask them, please give up this seat for, uh, uh, for my distinguished guests. More distinguished than them. And then if that were to happen, the presumptuous guests would then need to take the back seat. And if this were to happen, imagine the embarrassment. Right? Imagine it happened to us. How would we feel? I was at a wedding dinner once, just about maybe a couple of years before the MCO. <clears throat> I saw a couple yeah, seated with us in the upfront table to the side of the main table. And we were all chatting, introducing one to another for a time. And soon after, another couple came by to our table. And then the host's son, you know, the son of the host, came by and then requested 
the couple who were seated to vacate their seats. You can imagine their embarrassment. I, I felt embarrassed for them as well when I was there. I wouldn't want to be in that kind of situation, would you? Now, Jesus counseled the guests wisely instead to take the lowest place when invited by someone to a wedding feast. And I want to say here, we are not talking, talking about the modern day, the number system of the table and all that. Huh? That is not the point. <clears throat> so in those days, Jesus counseled the guests wisely and said, when you come to the wedding feast, you take the lowest place. And when you are invited there, because when the host were to then decide to move you up to a higher place, then you would be honored in the presence of all. Not embarrassed, but you can sit uh, at the table with them in a higher place. So the point of the parable of the guests is clear, is clear. Those who put themselves above others, they risk being put down or put to shame or humiliated. And precisely this, Jesus warned against the sin of self-exaltation. <clears throat> and we'll see that in the slide there from Luke chapter 14, verses 7 to 11. However, those who humble themselves, they stand to be honored. And so Jesus said these words, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. There's no middle ground. Yeah, you are either this or that. And this has been the timeless divine principle. What principle? To ignore or spurn it will be a great eternal loss. To take heed and practice it will be a great blessing. Jesus did not tell others what to do without exemplifying it. So we read in John 13, Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 to 9, we read too, Jesus gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. He came down from glory. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. So, church, let us remember what Jesus said in the verse that is shown on the slide. Next scene, Jesus turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors. Now, this is not talking about like Chinese New Year. Of course, Chinese New Year this year, we will all uh, be in our homes. We cannot travel into state because of the MCO. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this passage is not kind of to be applied in that kind of situation. Uh, uh, but you must not understand why Jesus said spoke the parable in the face of the Pharisees. Yeah, you need to understand the context. <clears throat> and so, when Jesus told the parable of the host, uh, he told the the the, the host now, uh, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet. Don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back. And that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of the just, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. For Jesus to counsel them in the way he did suggests to us that it would have been the host 
lifestyle to invite only those of his own kind. And they would in turn invite him back. Such a practice also happens in our days, correct? Whether it is inviting people to a luncheon or a dinner in the home, or whether even in the giving of uh, festive items, yeah, uh, items, gifts during festive season, so on. And sometimes that happens as well. You give, and then you, you, you receive, and then you give back to the person. Uh, usually the same person, yeah. Uh, very few people think about giving to the people uh, who have not given to them and they are the social outcasts and so on. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> in this parable of the host, such a thought of inviting the poor, crippled, lame, and blind, just picture now for a moment, yeah, how they look like, maybe you even, even have seen them before in their lives, by the roadside or somewhere else. Or maybe they have some of them have come to our church before, right? Uh, the blind young adult Ruth has come to our church before. Yeah. Uh, the people who cannot walk have come to our church before. Yeah. And such a thought of inviting the poor, yes, the poor community, uh, uh, people have come to our church before as well, right? Such a thought of inviting the poor, crippled, lame, or blind would not have entered the minds of the Pharisees. Not before. And I'm not sure whether it will when Jesus spoke the parable to them, that they may, their hearts may be transformed. So at the point of Jesus speaking to them, uh, their lives until then, <clears throat> and even after Jesus has spoken, as we go on to the other parables as well, and other uh, teachings of Jesus, uh, of the Pharisees, uh, we will see that the Pharisees, uh, they, they, they fell into the sin of failing to care for the needy. Yeah? So that is the sin that they committed. How much space do we, uh, do the needy people, the marginalized, uh, the social outcasts, the, uh, uh, the migrants, the asylum seekers today, you know, the foreign workers, uh, the people who come to our house, um, maybe every alternate day or every third day, you know, to throw our rubbish and uh, the security guard uh, down there in a, in a condominium or outside our uh, landed property. How much space do the needy people occupy uh, uh, in our minds that results in concrete actions? You and I have to wrestle or answer these questions in all honesty before God, in our conscience before God. Now, if anyone has reached out to such people before, and I know in our church, there are people who are doing that before. You will know that these people, yeah, the underprivileged class, the underserved people, they cannot repay with a similar kind deed in return. And that is okay when they don't return anything to us when we do a kind deed to them. And so he who helps them need not be repaid by them. This is fine attitude to have. But God is not unjust. God will not overlook the work done to the poor, the infirmed, the needy. God will remember and God will repay the righteous, the righteous ones, the humble ones who help the needy people at the resurrection of the righteous. And we should be encouraged by this, that there's going to be the resurrection for those who are righteous, who are in a right relationship with God. Yeah? And primarily, be, primarily because uh, these people, uh, they humble themselves in repentance 
and in service to his people. And God remembers them at the resurrection. And they will receive that great uh, heavenly uh, reward or blessings from God. That is God. Of course, we don't work uh, to do all these things because of reward, but God knows what to do. And that is sufficient for us. Now, at the last Friday's prayer meeting, uh, several people were there uh, at the prayer meeting, and uh, Ting Ong, uh, remember, shared that it is easier to say, God bless you, than to put God's word into action. Such actions, as mentioned, in the verses that Ting Ong quoted to us, Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 36. <clears throat> and we can have a look at that in the slide as well. He says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And so church, let us beware of the attitude and the action of the Pharisees. Or the people like the ghosts, you know, in this uh, parable in Matthew 25. The sheep, the people who are like the sheep will do all the things that is shown on the screen. But beware of the attitude and action of the Pharisees. They had no heart for the needy. They only talk. <clears throat> uh, they had no heart like the man for the, for, the, for, the, for the needy people, like the man whose body was swollen with fluid. Okay. But Jesus met the needs of the needy man who was sick, but not the man, uh, not the Pharisees. In fact, as I mentioned before, yeah, it is probable that they planted him there instead to trap Jesus. And the, and the Pharisees did this thing for the needy man. Actually, he did something for the needy man. And the something is called nothing. And Jesus said, when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. And there's blessing from God, the great blessing at the resurrection of the just that uh, we heard earlier before. We must move on to the parable of the great banquet. When a man sitting at the table with Jesus heard this, heard what Jesus had spoken earlier, he exclaimed, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So earlier we heard the guests were being presumptuous. They presumed they were, they were self-confident. Uh, they, they were even uh, acted arrogantly in a way <clears throat> because they chose a place of honor, the best seats for themselves without consideration for others. Yeah, It's not just like uh, going to the, uh, the LRT, you know, the train and all that, and you see an elderly man or a pregnant lady and then you are seated there, and then you, you, you rise from your seat and then say, okay, excuse me, you can have my seat. Huh? Well, that would have been courteous. That would have been uh, uh, consider considering the interests of others, but not them. Uh, that's my seat, yeah, uh, my honored seat. And the sin of presumption appeared again. For the man exuberantly, even brashly, presumed the Pharisees were blessed in the kingdom of God, when in fact they were not. The man spoke that spoke words that were right. What words? Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Those were the right words they spoke, but their hearts were not in a right relationship with God. And so beware of the sin of presumption. Beware of self-confidence and subtle arrogance. Beware of self-congratulation, thinking things are okay from personal perspective 
when from the divine perspective, things can well be the opposite. Perhaps even a shocking surprise to discover one day. So beware of self-deception. Beware of, of this. Eh? Uh, beware of failing to focus on what Jesus had laid emphasis. And what did Jesus stress? Among other things, to reach out to the needy as the evidence of one's repentance and faith in God. Beware of business as usual, being comfortable with a lifestyle like the Pharisees that focused on self, but not others, that focused on one's own kind of people, but not the, un not the underprivileged, the infirmed, the needy, the marginalized, marginalized yeah, the migrants, the asylum uh, seekers, yeah, the security guards, the uh, less well-off people, the rubbish collectors, and so on. Beware of business as usual lifestyle, like the Pharisees. Beware of that. How would we describe ourselves then, in the light of Jesus' words to the Pharisees? That the answer can only come from us. And we have to speak that to God in all honesty. Beware also of not repenting of sin when it is called for. Beware of speaking just the right words, just like the, uh, the, the man speaking the right words just now. Beware of that when the relationship with God is not right. <clears throat> Because it's not going to be accepting, acceptable to God when there is, uh, uh, how to say, when things don't jive. Beware of the sin of presumption, in other words, that God still blesses those who persist with their unrepentant sins. And that's the point. To the man who was uh, being presumptuous, Jesus told him the parable of the great banquet. And I'll read it to you. A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come. Why? For everything is now ready. Then, but what happened? All who were invited made excuses not to come. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Still another said, I, got, I just got married, so I can't come. All said, please consider me. Excuse. Notice carefully. Yeah? All were, all the words were excuses. So beware of making flimsy, lame excuses. Making excuses can be a subtle form of rejection. So don't be self-conceived. Eh? Very subtle. And sometimes people excuse their making excuses and thinking everything is okay after having made the excuses. Excuses, making excuses can be a subtle form of rejection. Let me explain. So when, for example, a person has been invited for a function and he does not want to attend, then he serves up or provides an excuse. And then he gives the impression that he wants to attend the function. But actually in his heart, he actually has no intention to attend at all. And so he cranks up, he thinks, he invents an excuse to hide his real intention of not wishing to attend the function. So, an excuse is an excuse, period. A lame excuse, a flimsy excuse, is not the same as a genuine reason. We're not saying that there are no genuine reasons. There are, of course, genuine reasons. 
right? All these three excuses are as good as rejection in the eyes of Jesus. There's really no difference at all between rejecting an invitation to enter the kingdom of God and making excuses for not entering it. Therefore, those who were invited to the great banquet in the parable committed the sin of making flimsy or lame excuses. The same as the sin of rejecting Jesus. Because of unrepentant sin, none of those who were first invited will get even the smallest taste of Jesus' banquet. And that you can read for yourself in Luke chapter 20, 14, verse 24. And I was just reading from the NLT version. Thereafter, the master sent his servant saying, go quickly into the streets uh, and the alleys of the towns. No, there are many people there in the towns uh, and invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Go and invite them, you know. After the servant had done this, he reported, hey, there is still room for more. Wow. And so his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges. Yeah, maybe go to the agricultural farm, you know, and then you have the hedges, so on, and people may be planting and then are pruning and harvesting, whatever else, you not know, by the fence, by the hedges, and then go there, yeah, across the fence, across the hedge, and then the invite them, you know, to come uh, where, where, uh, where there may be fewer people there, but nonetheless go, because there's still room, you know, and urge anyone you can find to come so that the house will be full. Now, in the book of Revelation 19, verses 6 to 9, yeah, in verse 9, <clears throat> there is this verse that says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of course, there's the bridegroom and there's the bride. And the bride, we know, <clears throat> is the bride of Christ. Yeah, the church. And there's a bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's going to be this marriage supper of the Lamb. Yeah, there's going to be a great feast. Yeah, and it's like a marriage between, you know, it's like coming together, yeah, uh, uh, together of God's people, yeah, and, and the Lord himself, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you know, coming together to feast, to fellowship, you know, to be in the presence. Wow, what a great blessing it is, you know, that to be in the presence of God, of the presence of Lord Jesus Christ. And those, but those who committed and harbored unrepentant sins of self-exaltation, failing to care for the needy, the sin of presumption and the sin of making flimsy or lame excuses, as explained earlier, all these will be excluded from eating at Jesus' great banquet. Only those who are hum who humbly repented of their sins and have had faith in Jesus Christ and who backed up their faith that they claim to possess with good works, such as in reaching out to the underprivileged, the infirmed, and the needy. God will not only reward them, but they will also feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb to be in the presence of God. For that great supper, the fellowship with the Lord himself, and they will enjoy that great fellowship with God in heaven forevermore. And this is a word of grace for us, of us for those of us, really, those of us, Yes, at, on one hand, we read about the Pharisees and their lifestyle. Yes, the message can be disturbing. Yet the message, the same message, can also be comforting or encouraging if we have repented of our sins sincerely from our heart. And if we have believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, have faith in Him, and showed evidence of this faith in Him, we have the assurance from the God's word itself, from the divine perspective, God sends the word to us through his servant, even in the, uh, through the Apostle John in 1 John, uh, chapter 5, verses 11 to 12. We have that assurance. And this is a word of grace for those of us who are humble, who have repented, who have been healed of our spiritual disease of sin 
just as the man with that swollen body was healed by Jesus. And that portrays for us too that we can be healed spiritually by Jesus. And if we are humble to repent of our sins, believe in Jesus, then we shall be back and be blessed at the marriage supper of the Lamb. To conclude, brothers and sisters in the Lord and friends, Jesus' parables of the guest, the host, and the great banquet in today's passage forewarn us of at least four things. One, sin of self-exaltation. Honor self over others, even over Jesus. Not giving glory to Jesus, even when we see the magnificent things, the miraculous things done by Jesus. Yeah, sometimes uh, the sin of self-exaltation is, is too much in us. Uh, even when we hear people coming to be saved, and sometimes you know, in testimonies, for example, people are saved, people are healed, yeah? and sometimes there's not even a praise God in the mouth because there's so much of self within the head and in the heart, and people can't even glorify and praise God. And that's a sin of self-exaltation, thinking too much of ourselves. Can't even praise God. And there's also, of course, a sin of failing to care for the needy. And I've explained at length at that. A sin of presumption that God, the, the presumption that God still blesses those who persist with uh, their unrepentant sins. And then we can, that there are people who can say all the right words, you know, quote the right scriptures and so on, even speak the words that the the man just now spoke about, yeah, when the heart relationship is not right with God. There's no, <clears throat> there's a discrepancy. Things doesn't jive between words and the heart. That's a sin of uh, presumption. And of course, we need to be, we, we today, we also forewarn, yeah, about the sin of making flimsy or lame excuses of uh, rejecting Jesus' invitation to taste his banquet, that we may be greatly blessed yeah, and receive God's reward of blessing and, and, and blessings of joy, a blessing of just being with him in the heavenly places. Now, if there is anyone who has not accepted Jesus' invitation to taste his banquet, you can freely do so today. And I would urge you to do so today. Yeah? Don't hang on, not, not, don't postpone, yeah? Until tomorrow, I will urge you because some we don't we are not guaranteed tomorrow, yeah. And with here, we are in love. I would urge you, yeah, to to accept Jesus' invitation. And you can pray a prayer as simple and meaningful as this. I want to just pray for you, if you are that person, dear God. Against you and you only have I sinned. Please forgive my sins. Lord Jesus, I believe and receive you into my life as my Savior and Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, if anyone has prayed that prayer, I would like to speak to you. Yeah, yeah. There is this uh, SMC office email shown earlier, or you can go to the chat group. <coughs> yeah. Uh, please contact us and we will get back. I will get back to you. For those of us, beloved of God, beware of falling into the sins as the unrepentant Pharisees did. Beware of their business as usual lifestyle that focus on their own kind of people only, but not the needy, the infirmed, the sick, <clears throat> the crippled, the blind, the marginalized, the underprivileged, the underserved, those with physical, spiritual, and emotional needs. Beware of their lifestyle of doing nothing for these people. Beloved of God, I just want to affirm for all of us too, and here's a word of grace. Yes, we may be disturbed in some portions of the scriptures, the words that Jesus spoke, 
but Jesus also at the same time spoke words of hope and of grace. And we need to hear that as well. And we need to be reminded as well. There will be a time when God will exalt those of us who are humble in repentance and in service. The time will come. It may not be now, but surely it will come. And the resurrection of the just, of the righteous, of the humbly, of those who humbly repent. And God will reward the righteous, those who are in a right relationship with him. We may not be paid, repaid on earth in doing all the good works. That's okay. But surely the Lord Jesus, our Lord Jesus, had promised us that in heaven we will be blessed, much blessed. Right? Blessed to be in his presence forevermore. Blessed with eternal life. Blessed with joy. And whatever other blessings he may lavish upon us. And so we thank God uh, on one hand for his warning. And we also thank God for his encouragement for the humbly righteous people of God in God's sight. Let us pray. Let us bow down before the Lord in prayer. I just want to give us some time yeah, for us to respond in your own way, in your, from a, in your own home. Yeah? Take some moments for yourself to pray. Father in heaven, uh, <clears throat> look down, Lord. Consider, Lord, the people, your people, Lord, who have prayed to you. Look into your hearts. <clears throat> we need you. Lord, even among those of us too, Lord, who may have repented to you humbly from their hearts, hear their prayers. Hear my prayer as well, Lord Jesus. We seek thee, Lord, and welcome you to continue, Lord, to transform our heart and to renew our mind. We need that. We thank you, Lord, now too, for the encouragement you give to us. Your word of grace and your, your, your word of hope for us. And the word of blessings, Lord, for those, Lord, who are humble and repentant and have faith in you. That the day will come, Lord. We will sup with you. We will dine with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is the hope, Lord, we have in you. So we give you thanks. And we pray, God, Lord Jesus. May you continue, Lord, to enable us to have a lifestyle. That attitude worked out in actions that honors you more and more. Inconsistent, Lord, with the words that you have mentioned to us to reach out to the underprivileged class. In our Lord Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. Amen.